Hey, Nelson, alcoholic addict. That's not my real name. That is my pen name that I use here at LOL Sober. I think a good chunk of the people who subscribe to this newsletter are in recovery themselves. But I also know a bunch of subscribers who are, they're just interested in the the sober community. And so they signed up for this newsletter. And so I thought it would be fun to run through some of the questions I get asked the most about sobriety from either from people who are not in recovery themselves and just are are wondering about it or from curious people I've run into over the years who seem so interested in what sobriety is like and how did it happen and all of that that I often wonder if this person might benefit from it in a meeting themselves. Um, so I, I came up with 10. I bet you there's more. If, there, if I miss something good... Uh, comment either on this newsletter post or on Twitter or wherever you find this newsletter. So, number 10, can you drink non-alcoholic beer? Uh, I remember somebody asking me this question and then a bunch of follow-ups about it and I couldn't help but think, does this guy want to stop drinking himself but he really, really, really likes the taste of beer and is worried he won't miss it? Um, Either way, my answer is that I cannot drink non-alcoholic beer. I don't know about other people, but I can't. I believe I believe there's trace amounts of alcohol in non-alcoholic beer, but don't fact check me on that. Um, I, I, either way, I can't because drinking was a ritualistic behavior for me. There was a whole bunch of things that happened when I drank. It wasn't just sitting there with beer or whatever. And so... Anything that starts up that ritualistic behavior, I can't even mess with. And I personally don't really want to drink non-alcoholic beer anyway. I I never drank because I loved the flavors, you know. I loved the effects until I didn't, of course. So that was number 10. Number nine, what will you do at parties? Get that one a lot. I get that one a lot because having a drink in your hand is it's just... It feels like such a fundamental part of many parties. It's like a, uh, a thing that people do. They have something in their hands, so it's a little bit less awkward as they're wandering around. I don't know. I will say two things. One, nobody really notices or cares if it's a Diet Coke or a water in your hand instead of an alcoholic drink. I haven't had that experience anyway. I've never had anybody like <laughs> test my drink or really pay much attention at all. Most people at parties I've been at, they're half tipsy themselves and they don't really give a shit about anything other than their own drink anyway. The other thing is I got sober at age, I was 32 years old and I'm 44 now. I'm married and I have three kids and a full-time job. And so the party scene for me (laughs) is, it's pretty lame. It's pretty calm. I'll say that. I'd say I only get invited to maybe five parties a year, probably less where there's significant boozing happening. Um, it's just, I'm just not in that orbit anymore. So I guess I, I guess if I were in college or I was single and 24 years old and I lived in New York city or something, this would be a thornier question. I get that. I totally get that. I think if I had tried to get sober as a junior in college, I would have had to make some real life choices and and tough decisions on Saturday nights. But, but I do, I will also say I know plenty of young people who have a much cooler social lives than me, and they have found a way to juggle not drinking while also hanging out with groups of people and dating and all of that other stuff. So the short answer to what do you do at parties is it is possible to have a party or two in your life and not drink. Question number eight, uh, this is about meetings themselves. Uh, How much does it cost? If you want to be sober and go to a 12-step program. How much does it cost? And I think I think sometimes people conflate rehab treatment programs with 12-step programs. The truth is 12-step recovery costs nothing. We do we p- pass a basket at meetings to pay the rent and buy books and things like that, but you don't have to give anything. Um I see people routinely not give. Sometimes I don't have any money. Sometimes I listen, you know, no big deal. We always seem to get the rent paid somehow. So the answer is it, it kind of costs nothing. I give a dollar or a couple dollars every meeting I go to just because I want to keep coming. Question number seven, was it hard? I get this. I, it, was it hard to get sober? And how do you answer that question? I, it's a tough one. Um, 
it's so broad. On one hand, yes, because I wanted to stop drinking and drugging for about five years before I actually did. I knew my life was unmanageable with alcohol and drugs in it. And I, so I wanted to stop and I tried all this stuff and it just didn't, didn't happen. So I knew the pain and suffering it caused for me and for other people every single day and I couldn't stop. So does that classify as a hard habit to break? Yeah, I think it does. But, and as, as far as the first month or so of sobriety, yeah, that, that was an entirely new life. It was scary. It was hard. I, physically, I couldn't sleep. And when I got mad or I were sad or, or any big feeling, I, I didn't know what to do if I couldn't reach for a substance to take care of the problem. So, yeah, there were parts of early recovery that were indeed quite difficult. But I will say, on the other hand, no, the things that I have got that have gotten me sober and kept me sober are not very complex. Like I went to 90 meetings in 90 days and I got a sponsor and I worked a program and and it all came together. You know, I work pretty hard to stay sober, but I don't work as hard to stay sober as I did to get drunk and high every day. That was a full-time job, and I had no money, and I always felt horrible, and everybody was always mad at me. That sucks. You know, getting to one meeting every day is not as hard as that life. So I guess my short answer is at a certain point, it becomes much harder to stay active than it is to stop. And so that was my experience. So was it hard? I don't, I don't know. How, yes and no, I guess. Question number six, do you have to be religious to get sober? This, this is an interesting question that people would probably answer a little differently if you went around and asked 10 people. But I would give what is probably the most common answer, which is that the founders of 12-step programs said quite frequently that um, our programs are spiritual programs, not religious programs. And we use the words God and higher power quite a bit, and we say prayers at meetings and things like that. But it's it's a program of suggestions. Nobody's ever like maybe sign a letter saying I pray this number of times to this God or anything like that. You know, there's lots of wiggle room, lots of wiggle room to. Uh, I would call it a choose your own God adventure. You figure out what it is. So, do you have to be religious to get sober? I think the answer for me, the answer is no. Question number five, do you like being in 12-step programs? That's an interesting one. People, uh, <laughs> people ask that to me like it's like a, like a fun little club. And um, I haven't gotten it, th- this question too many times recently, but it's, it's often from people who they seem to think it's like Brussels sprouts. And I, I get it. Going to meetings, it's often portrayed on TV as something that's prescribed to people by judges or police or whatever because the people got in trouble and they need to do these things in order to avoid jail time. But for me personally, I I don't like being in 12-step programs. I love it. And I don't love it for some really impressive reason. I love it because my life got a lot better. If I had a disease and some medication cured it, if I took the pill every day and then my life got better and better every day, I I mean, do I need to keep going? Like, yeah, I like it. Question number four, is it, is it just a bunch of old dudes in church basements? Uh, yeah. I remember, I, I've said this one myself jokingly, but it's not, really, it's not really been true in my experience. I'm sure there are meetings that look and smell like old dudes in a church basement, but I've had no trouble finding all sorts of meetings with a diverse group of people. By Come up with any demographic you want, you can find a meeting that, that kind of... Um, has a lot of people like that, if that's what you're looking for. So do a lot of meetings happen in church basements? Well, I, you know, I do find myself in quite a few churches and it is the basement oftentimes. But um, when I've been asked about that, I get the sense that people are envisioning these like dark secret dungeons down in the guts of a church past all the boxes of old Bibles and the air conditioner that doesn't work anymore from the rectory. And that, that hasn't been my experience. They're well lit and beautiful places to try to catch a dose of sobriety. All right. So number three and number two, I'm going to, I'm going to make this a bonus two uh, two part question. Uh, part one was, can you still smoke weed? Get that one a lot. A lot of people say that now. And in my first few years of sobriety, I don't ever remember anybody asking me that but then since legalization of marijuana has been uh on an uptick over the past decade or so i've heard it quite a bit and including from a a few newcomers who were coming to their first meetings and wondering if like hey if i stop drinking can i still smoke some weed and 
It's a tricky one to answer in general because I've heard people make compelling cases that most of our sober literature focuses heavily on alcoholism and alcoholism alone. It's like the sole focus. Um, And I've definitely heard people identifying themselves as alcoholic addict. That's how I identify. Or they just say addict or cross addicted or something like that. And then I've heard of people being told that, hey, these, these, this is a meeting that's for alcoholics. And if you're not an alcoholic, um, then, you know, you should think about a different meeting. And um, I was at a different 12-step fellowship recently where the group conscience was that they asked people to I- identify as clean, not sober. Um, so there's some tricky language around that. But um, – I personally don't get too hung up on that stuff. I have a more liberal interpretation of all of it because I I know the truth about me and my addictions. I can't I can't drink alcohol, I can't smoke weed, I can't take pills. I, I can't really do anything. There's no mood altering substances. I am I I say I'm an alcoholic and an addict and I consider myself clean and sober. All of the above. Uh and then the other part of this is is um, you know the reason it's a two question, it's it's two questions for the price of one is um, I've noticed in the past year or two as legalized gambling sweeps through the country, I've gotten asked more and more, are you able to can you smoke weed? And then what about gambling? Gambling kind of gets thrown in there as the second part of that. Um, my answer is that I personally do not gamble because I I just know it wouldn't end well for me. Um, <laughs> so I. When I was active with drugs and alcohol, I did gamble quite a bit. I never got into too much trouble with it, but, well, I didn't get into as much trouble as booze and pills caused anyway. Um, but I saw it doing some of the same things to my brain, um, so I avoided it at all costs. All right, last but not least, the number one question that I get asked the most, I think, is, do you have to go to meetings forever? And, well, let me put it this way. Yes. As long as I view forever as one day at a time, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to be. I don't know if I'm going to need to be sober for five more weeks, or five more months, or five more decades, or a hundred more years. I don't know. Just trying to make sure I don't drink or do drugs today. And um, I know that's like a lame answer, right? One day at a time. But it. Re- so to to answer the question fully, um, I will say that I I've, I've often considered. I've wondered that myself, even when I got into the rooms, and I started hearing the one day at a time mantra. Um, So it's like a normal thing to wonder, I think, because when I first got sober, I'd never been arrested. I never had a suspended driver's license, never gotten a DUI, never got fired from my job. I was married to the same person that that I had been. So I never even bought drugs from a drug dealer. So I remember thinking, like, maybe somebody like me wasn't bad enough. Maybe, maybe, Maybe it wasn't as bad... Um, as these other people. Maybe I don't need meetings for the rest of my life. Maybe I'll just go for a couple of months and stop drinking and drugging and then I'll be okay. And well, I can genuinely laugh at that now because I belonged. I belonged in my seat at rehab and I earned my spot at 12 step meetings too. Um, and so to end this thing, to harp, I'll just harp on the same point I made earlier and I make it in this newsletter all the time. I don't view, um, I don't use the word, I have to go to meetings. I I say I want to go to meetings. And again, it's not because I'm a spiritual superstar. I'm far from it. It's just my life is better when I do. I'm happier. My wife and kids are happier. My coworkers are happier. And the people at parties who are asking me all of these questions about sobriety, they're happier too because I'm not face down, ass up in their bathtub in a pile of my own vomit. (laughs) So... (laughs) I want to go to sobriety. I want to go to 12-step meetings. And um, on, on, on that note, uh, have a happy Thursday and, and try not to get too hung up on <laughs> the visual of me on my face, passed out in a bathtub and puke. So thank you for letting me share.